Hey, Paul. Hello, Villa. Another episode. Indeed. Do you know when you kind of get this sinking feeling at the bottom of, the, of your stomach when you know something bad is about to happen? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's normally just before one of my children starts screaming. Yeah. And in this case, it's probably because, uh, because uh, I'm about to get exposed to a, one of the jokes uh, again. Am I right? Yes. Possibly. So. It, there, there is a high chance of that. Right? All right. But Let's yes, do it. You want to hear a joke? Go for, go for it, man. Okay. What is a bank manager's favorite social media app? I don't know, Paul. Tell me. Pinterest. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> now, I would like to say that that fantastic joke was supplied to us by a Derek Barkley who, uh, who resides in Sweden. So we want to thank him for that fantastic joke. We love the good, bad jokes. Wow. That's, uh, that was the first one. We actually got a listener joke in. That was, uh, that's a good one. Yep. Good one and a bad one. And that's exactly how we like it. Yes. Very good. But hello, dear listeners out there, and welcome back to Fintech Daydreaming. Uh, this is the podcast that dives into the world of banking technologies and the ever-changing landscape of fintech companies with real-life examples from guests and experts across the board. We are, as always, seeking out interesting fintech stories and insights ranging from emerging technologies to game-changing disruptive ideas brought to, brought to us by the big banks, tech companies, fintech startups, all seeking to challenge the status quo with revolutionary ideas and big fantastic dreams. This, my friends, is Fintech Daydreaming. Welcome back to the show, everybody. My name is Ville Sainto, and I will be your host today for this episode. And man, it's actually really nice to be back on the driver's seat for a change. Uh, because as, as you probably noticed, uh, for the past two episode, episodes have been carefully and diligently piloted by my co-host, Paul Krugdahl, who, by the way, is here with us. Hi, Paul. How's life? Hey, Villa. Life is fantastically good, as always. You know, it's great to be alive. Yeah. Don't you agree? Well, kind of. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a cliche to talk about the weather, but we did get the first snow in Helsinki uh, just this week. So, yeah, it's, it's not, a good, it's not a good start, I think. I, I don't know. I mean, I actually like that first moment of snow uh, each year. It, it shows that the winter is coming and, and you get a cozy feeling, time to load the, light the fire and those sort of things. Then it takes about three or four days and you think it's too cold. I want to get yeah, to snow. Exactly, exactly. It's fun for a second. Uh, luckily, with the exactly. luckily with the climate change, you know, as soon as the snow comes down, it's almost gone immediately. I just, you know, there's only one time in the year, which is uh, in, the, in the middle of Christmas time when, uh, when I actually welcome snow. Uh, other than that, I'm quite happy uh, without it. And indeed, Spain sounds fantastic uh, as soon as the corona thing goes away. That might be a, that might yes. be a while, but uh, we'll see about that. But you know, Paul, uh, when in our last episode we introduced the idea to ask our listeners to send us jokes, uh, I actually never thought that we would actually get any of these jokes. But as you just heard, uh, we did get the first one, uh, uh, and uh, it looks actually we might be off the hook uh, for coming up with bad jokes ourselves for a while because we have more lined up. So turns out. We have some really awesome listeners. And for that, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, please keep the jokes coming uh, and keep them bad or keep them good. Uh, we like them all. So thank you for that. But as someone famous probably once said, uh, on with the show. Uh, today, we're going to continue talking about how interesting companies are bringing financial services, sometimes kicking and screaming, into the 21st century. More specifically, we're going to talk about data, analytics, Internet of Things, and yes, we're even going to go there, artificial intelligence. Now, to do this discussion properly, we're joined by someone who actually does all these things uh, for a living, Rasmus Thompson from Fotail. I'm going to let Rasmus introduce himself and Flowtail in a second, but before that, I do need to add that it's an absolute delight each time we get, get true tech startups to visit our podcast. 
for the past two couple of episodes, we actually had some C-level executives from financial services to, to, to join us. And uh, uh, I think it's a welcome uh, kind of change to see the other side of this and the startup founders uh, joining our show is a kind of welcome change. Uh, and it's really great to hear uh, informative uh, talks from, uh, from both sides uh, of the uh, fintech ecosystem. Now, without further ado, welcome to Fintech Daydreaming, Rasmus. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for having me. No worries. Uh, so I guess we have to do the mandatory weather stuff again. So how's the weather where, where, wherever you are right now? Well, there's no snow. So, so hearing about your snow, I'm actually getting a little bit more happy. Because it's, <laughs> it hasn't arrived here yet. Right. And uh, you are in uh, Copenhagen? Or? Copenhagen, That's exactly. Right. That's right. So good. Uh, do you? I think you don't even get snow in Copenhagen. But anyway. Uh, no, nah, I don't know. I, I think the global warming has taken care of that a few years ago. Yeah. yeah. But it's rare. Yeah. It's very rare. That's true. That's true. So, Rasmus, uh, now that we have you here, uh, could you tell a little bit uh, about yourself, Floatail, and what you do uh, at Floatail? Yes, I will be happy to. Um, so, um, my name is Rasmus, uh, and I'm a partner at, at Floatail. Um, and we at Floatail, we are a uh, Nordic data science and engineering consultancy, uh, a boutique, if you will. We're just below 20 people. Um, where we work with uh, primarily larger Nordic uh, organizations and, and corporates um, with a slight focus, uh, not by choice, but basically by experience and exposure in, in financial services and, and also in the supply chain vertical. Uh, and I can add to that that we have a current headquarters here in, in, in Copenhagen, uh, which is why I'm sitting here, but of course have exposure in, in all the four Nordic countries. All right. Sounds sounds exactly the right type of uh, profile that we need to have an interesting conversation today <laughs> about uh, about data. How about that? Uh, I hope so. Yeah, indeed. And uh, at, the, at, at full disclosure, at this point, by the way, I do need to add that Floatail is working on a couple of uh, very exciting projects with my employer or their bank. But uh, today we won't be focusing on these projects, uh, at least not yet. We'll see about uh, perhaps in the future. But uh, the topic of the episodes, like I uh, alluded to already, is really about making sense of data. Now, from a bank perspective, I mean, historically, banks uh, have been quite bad with data. And there's, a, I think, a more almost like a historical reason for that. And the reason is that banks, for, for the most part, have been incentivized to be walled off uh, from the outside world. The, the banks uh, actually, if you if you kind of would ask my uh, IT or our IT department's uh, security heads, uh, they would be happy if we would have no access channels, uh, no customers, uh, or indeed no external data uh, involved with the process, because th that's the only way you are one hundred percent sure that you will never have any security breaches. Now, because of this kind of uh, almost like a mental or technical legacy setup, uh, most banks uh, traditionally are, are not wired uh, to be great uh, at understanding data. Now, especially the data that is not related to day-to-day -day transactions, like uh, kind of accepting external data uh, is extremely difficult uh, for banks. And this is kind of related to the trust problems uh, that the banks have with the outside world. Trusting any external data source uh, always means that you have to check the background and you have to take a risk on accepting that data. And therefore, uh, it kind of creates a complicated setup where you have to have very uh, detailed due diligence on all the data sources. And because of this kind of an attitude, it's, it's, uh, it's not really uh, part of the kind of DNA of banks to, to work uh, in a good way uh, with data. But that being said, uh, many banks are actually working uh, working uh, to move away uh, from this model. I mean, we all understand that data is a fundamental building block, block of uh, next generation financial, uh, digital financial ecosystem. Why? Well, better data actually equals lower risk. Real-time data insights equals faster processes and smarter decisions. And this, in turn, means lower transaction cost. The opportunities are practically endless. The problem here, of course, is combining risk management, regulatory compliance, customer trust, data analy analytics, and how do you actually put, put all of this together without breaking something? That is the billion or trillion euro question in this space. 
But today we actually want to broaden, broaden the lens a little bit outside of banking because we have an opportunity to look at these issues from a tech technical vendor perspective who is also working both in and outside of financial services with, with data and analytics uh, and, and uh, data predictions. And perhaps we can even hear some first-hand experiences on how companies from all kinds of industry verticals are leveraging data-driven uh, opportunities uh, today. Now, Rasmus, we talked a little about Floatel and how, how you got started, but uh, we're curious, uh, what did you see out there when you actually set, set out to start Floatel as a company? What was the problem uh, that you saw worth uh, solving and why did you think that you were the best one to solve it? Well, that's a two-parter. Um... I think the first question, uh, what we saw when we started, I think you said it yourself, you said the, the opportunities are practically endless. Um, I think that's true to a large extent. Uh, and I think the way that we saw it was more like a, let's call it a waste of data. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities being missed, a lot of uh, efficiencies not gained, uh, problems not solved, you can say, uh, where the, the, the root of the solution was actually right there in their own hands. Um, with their data, um, and especially, of course, with the large corporates that we work with, they generate so much data um, that that it almost becomes a problem. Um, so I think that's the high level reason that 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 we we, we jumped into this space. Um, and then I think I think there are two problems that that we see, uh, and 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 uh, I think one of them is basically that the, the talent uh, there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of tech talent out there. Um, but it's not that often that we find them at the at the big companies. Um, and I think that that the reason that uh, companies like ours are there is because um, these complicated skills that you need in order to be able to to deliver uh, solutions like this in an you know institutional context. Uh, I mean, those skills are very hard to find and they're very hard to identify. It doesn't mean that they're not there. Um, so so I think that the reason that that there is a place for us is that the the um, the HR challenge is quite hard. Uh, it's quite hard to, uh, when you have a recruitment process that is very much based on, you know, buzzwords on a piece of paper. So your resume is very hard to actually sort out who can really do uh, and implement and apply this technology. Um, because there's a lot of people that master as many technologies, but the, but the skill of actually, absolutely, you know, applying that. Um, I think that's the, that's the main reason that we're here. Uh, and then I think also that in order for us, and this is also kind of the problem that we saw among our competitors is that you need to have this institutional understanding uh, to, to implement things and implement solutions that really work. Um, mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly easy for, for IT people and, and developers to, to dump a, a, a you know, code on, on Git or in a code repository and then say, now here's the solution. Getting is really into the infrastructure and getting it into the to the company is is a completely different uh, different challenge and, and a much harder one. Um, and I think so. Understanding the institutional context, uh, which uh, has a gap in them because it's hard for for many large corporates to find the right talent, uh, and then of course understanding what you're actually delivering into. I, I think that was the the thing that we saw. But overall, again, back to there is so many opportunities out there and, and we've only scratched the top of the, the uh, you know, the, we've only seen the top of the iceberg. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I think you, you hit an interesting point there. Uh, when when you, when you have the, the brightest and the, and the greatest uh, coming out of universities and all sorts of uh, different places, effectively good talent, uh, especially in the financial services sector, it's it's sometimes a little bit hard to convince that uh, a kind of a legacy bank with all the issues that I just listed before uh, before now just here i mean it's it's not the most attractive place to go but uh, there's still some interesting problems uh, to solve uh, and perhaps kind of very, uh, very. some combination of of kind of this uh, tech setup uh, and with kind of this domain specific knowledge is interesting and maybe a bit of a follow up question there then i mean you you obviously have some uh, great talent in the in the data space and ai space how do you combine that with uh, with kind of vertical or domain specific knowledge uh, how do you kind of gain insights from uh, from well, in in this case, fintech uh, sector, for example, and how do you make sure uh, you have the right balance uh, between the tech technology knowledge and the and the domain knowledge? Well, I mean, what you're touching upon here is is basically alchemy, uh, <laughs> because I think it's very hard to find experts, uh, you know, in both. Um, so I can't sit here and say that we have the golden formula. What I can say is that, I mean, the recruitment process in our company takes, it's not a few interviews, it's basically, it takes a year. Mm. 
Uh, and I think the only thing that, that we, I mean, there are two things. You need to have, of course, the tech expertise, and we will be highly testing you in, 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 uh, in, in many ways. But you also need to have the corporate understanding, and it's it, it all leading position in our company. Uh, you know, so we have leads in in, in each tech and, and discipline. Uh, they need to have spent you know at least five plus years in in a larger corporate uh, within a certain uh, industry, uh, in order to kind of understand fully the the um, the um, you know the intricate parts of, of getting things to work in in in, in large corporates. Um, but then again, we don't cover many verticals. We cover a lot, I would say. Uh, but of course, you will also find blind spots uh, even in our company. Of course, of course. I guess having a three sixty degree of everything is uh, would be would be a tall <laughs> order for sure. Uh, but if you would kind of list uh, some of the some of the kind of uh, verticals that you are most experienced in, what what would those be? Well, I mean, I think supply chain, that's basically where, where the whole company was, was founded and the financial industry, which, which is something where, I mean, there are many facets to that uh, and there are many disciplines uh, and many different technologies to apply within the financial sector, of course. Uh, but due to the experience of the people that we've gotten in, uh, we've almost become uh, a, a, I wouldn't call it a fintech, but, but uh, it's a space where we're quite heavy in. Uh, yeah. Today. Depends on who asks, I guess. Uh, if, uh, if, it, if it's a venture capitalist asking, of course, <laughs> yeah, of you're course. a fintech because that always gets you a little bit more, right? <laughs> All right. So uh, data, yeah. quite obviously, like we just discussed, is an endless source of innovation and value for, well, fintechs, banks, their customers, uh, and well, both from an internal and external perspective. Now, you just told me how you work with uh, the data-driven insights and predictive models uh, from customers from like from the supply chain side and then obviously uh, in financial services to an, to an extent but tell me from you from your experience uh, what do you think are the main misconceptions uh, in this uh, kind of totally overhyped <laughs> hyped area and uh, where do you think are the biggest uh, growth opportunities something that uh, perhaps the industry is uh, seeing seeing wrong from your perspective uh, right now uh, well, I think I think you actually mentioned one of the misconceptions yourself uh, that that banking is boring for developer or, or for IT people. That is that is not true. Uh, it is definitely not true. Um, I think I think banks and and financial incumbents can as a whole be be boring to look at. For an IT person or developer, definitely not. Um, but I think I think from a fintech perspective and from a startup perspective, I think uh, there are a few things that needs to be taken into consideration when entering such a market where there's some misconceptions that can kind of lead people on. I think it's very important uh, to understand that adaptation rate uh, in, in, in the financial industry is, is way slower than what we see is being expected. I mean, it's a very sticky and, and very sticky habits in the, in the consumer space, uh, very conservative uh, behavior uh, around financial solutions because people, they are just very conservative when it comes to money and, and trust and, and the financial space in general. Uh, I think that's one of the, the, the biggest misconceptions that we see. I, I think another one is also, uh, and I'm not trying to be pessimistic here, but I'm just starting with maybe with the misconceptions here is that there is an idea maybe that there's always mm. room for another product. Uh, and and that and that might not be the case, um, especially not in finance, where due to the nature of the way that the the, the fin, uh, fintech sector and the, the French industry works, you, you often see people flock toward there's some sort of unheard effect, and, and you see people flock towards well, basically liquidity, but but flock towards clients. And and I mean, I can give one example, which is there's a lot of platforms being created these days for leading consumers uh, and hopefully also corporates mm. towards the right product. Uh, so this is a platform that can lead you to the best pension options or the, the best uh, conversion rates and things like that. Um, and, and there might be a few of them, but, but if you launch five at the same time and you see, let's say, 60% on one platform and 10% on the other, it's going to take two or three years, then it's going to be 100% on, mm. on the one and then zero on the other because you just see a migration towards where uh, basically the, the liquidity in both clients and of course money is. Um, and that of course doesn't go for, you know, replacing a backbone in a bank and things like that, but, but customer facing things, um, I think it's very important that you, you can always squeeze another product in the market, but you also need to be aware of that, uh, you know, there's fierce competition and it's a lot more fluent uh, that people, they tend to kind of like gravity go to the heaviest object. Um, that's, that's at least our experience. Uh, and, and then I think the last one, and, and I think that also comes from my, from my own uh, slight experience in banking myself, is 
I remember five years ago and, and 10 years ago, everyone was talking about how the banking landscape in five years will look different. And we will see banks, we've had books coming up, Bank 3.0 and those, you know, telling about how banks will, some will collapse under the new technology and things like that. And we're actually discussing in here at, at Floatel, you know, is there a misconception there? Because we've not yet seen any banks collapse to technology. We've seen banks mm. collapse, of course, but not to technology. Is that something that will happen? Uh, anytime soon, or is it a misconception that we will see the Kodaks and the Blockbusters and the Barnes and Noble and what have you in the banking sector as well? So we're actually not sure if that's a misconception or not, whether it will come later than expected. Uh, but it's a continuous topic that that banks will see that change. But but we've at least not seen anyone um, collapse to 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 technology yet. Um, and then. The, the, the next question you asked was mm. about the, the growth opportunities. Uh, I, I think there is some, there are some technology uh, levers there, but I think the, the so, so, so if you look at the financial industry and, and supply chain as well and, and other areas as well, I think we, we, we often see banks as trust and transactions. That's, that's what you get from the bank. Uh, where you can't get trust from your counterpart, you can artificially buy something, some trust from the bank and make sure that that, that there's trust in your relationship. And as well, of course, they facilitate um, the, the, the money flows. Um, and I think the, the biggest opportunity is exploiting the, the, uh, the trust. I'm not saying exploiting it sounds mm -hmm. negative, but using the trust. Um, uh, and of course, also exploit to an extent that consumers are conservative. I mean, they move very slow. And, and I think that the biggest opportunity here is to not start launching new things and not start you know, facing the customer and the consumer and the corporates with a radical change or radical disruption, you need to kind of, you know, lead them on a journey. You know, you, you launch, a, launch a new mobile app, you launch a new uh, net bank, you launch a new, you know, a, a derivative product that offers more services mm -hmm. and are more digital. Uh, and you should be careful facing them whether you want to stay on the old one or you want to go with the new one. But lead them on a journey, and and uh, and of course also you know bring in fintechs on that, and the fintechs, the new startups in the market should should of course leverage that and, and know that that sticky relationship is there, and, and yeah. I think there's opportunities there as well. Um, and then and then I think on top of that, uh, and just to add to that, um, we we see that there is an opportunity in in these because the more the financial industry evolves, more buying behavior is, mm. is guided by algorithms. Uh, and of course, the more the banks become data driven, more products will be sold based on, on the data that is provided by, by, by the clients so that, and the consumers, so they mm. get the right product. That makes sense. But I think to this extent, we are arguing a lot, you know, will the regulators be able to, to be the objective, uh, you know, part in this and make sure that the consumers are not getting overbuying or, or underbuying or getting things that they don't need. And I think there's a huge space there to go in and be the trust, uh, the, the, the trustworthy partner that understands the underlying algorithms that are actually mm -hmm. supplying these products uh, and, and giving you a, a transparency into, into this, this aspect as well. And then, of course, I, I can't get around a blockchain. Uh, we, we see a huge opportunity in blockchain as well. We've seen that opportunity for a long, long time. And the question is, how much it will it will impact the market but we do see and we will continue to see that the whole trust issue that the financial sector is providing to the whole business sphere and also the consumer space uh, there is potential in blockchain technology uh, to, to 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 take that over uh, in what capacity and in what way of course um let's see but, but, but of course, we, we just have to of mention course. that as well when you talk about Of course, uh, we, yeah, we yeah, talked about uh, blockchain or what we call the B word uh, quite a bit in this podcast. And uh, and uh, yeah, uh, Rasmus, you made you, yeah. yeah, and Rasmus, we, you we made some, indeed, some really yes. great points uh, yeah. in, your, in your answer there. Uh, I think the, one of the really interesting topics that uh, that kind of goes across many of the conversations that we have in this podcast is, is the question of trust. Trust takes ages to build, uh, yet you can lose it uh, overnight. Uh, but the uh, 
but the fact of the matter is that this kind of staying power uh, of certain financial legacy fi legacy financial institutions is is based a lot on the fact that people tend to default to trust uh, when dealing with regulated institutions. People trust that there is the, the government oversight or the supervisory oversight uh, in the uh, uh, in the local markets is making sure that you can, to a certain extent, trust uh, banks. We can of course discuss mm -hmm. whether that is earned or not, but I think this uh, system is built like that, and uh, and uh, yeah, I think the. The, the trust element is is big part of the staying power uh, in despite of this uh, technology legacy that is uh, that is existing with the banks. I literally just put mm. a slide together this week that said uh, that's a bank 4.0. Uh, so, so I think uh, let's see let's see how, okay. how how long how kind of far away we go with the numbers before I, I'm done with my career uh, in the in the coming decade. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Paul, did you have any insights on uh, on Rasmus's uh, great points? Yeah, ab absolutely. I'd... I, I can resonate quite uh, well with some of the points you made. Uh, I think most consumers are are feeling very, very confused. You, you mentioned products. I think banks have proliferated the, the market with too many products. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not just banks. I mean, I, I when I present, I very often use Colgate as, as an example. They have too many different types of toothpaste for us to select from, right? And And they just add to that. And, and what we really want is just a simplistic view on what toothpaste do I need for me or what toothpaste do I need to buy for my children? I don't need 64 different types of toothpaste to pick from. And, and banks have sort of done the same thing. They've, their, their main way of, of driving revenue or income is, is through creating new products and very often just variations of the same products. And it really has got to a point where the consumer is very confused. And particularly as you go more and more into to digital channels where you separate the consumer from the advisory capabilities of the bank and the consumer is left on their own devices to be able to make decisions and, and decide what to do with their money and how to look after their financial life. Um, they get more and more into this area of lack of trust and, and uncertainty. And I think with AI capabilities, with analytics, we can start turning this around to start actually advising the consumers again into what is the right product. But at the same time, I think the banks need to reduce the number of, of products they've got, simplify their offerings and find the right ways of engaging with the customers. I talk a lot about what I call the data enabled client, which is sort of this next step past a uh, data driven bank where the banks really have to rethink how they're going to engage with the customers to be able to give them continued advisory capabilities as they mm -hmm. move further and further yeah. into digital channels. Yeah, I think this uh, is an interesting uh, interesting way that how do we package this uh, trust and how do we kind of maintain the trust and yet uh, kind of use the data in a, in a good way uh, to, to make all of this kind of work. Uh, I, I kind of a fun, funny story. I mean, I, I bought, bought a new toothbrush uh, last week and it literally says that it's powered by artificial intelligence. I have no idea what that means, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 apparently it's it's supposed to be good. So maybe this kind of uh, powered by AI type of uh, situation for banks uh, might be a positive thing uh, towards the consumers as well. I don't know. But hey, uh, it, re it really sounds to us was like you, you spend a lot of time with, uh, with different kinds of customers uh, working on, on these topics. Uh, kind of switching gears a little bit. Uh, it, it, are there, do you have any fun war stories you'd like to share uh, with our listeners? Well, I mean, we have so many that, that it might be hard to pick. But, but I have one that I think everyone can, can relate to. Go for um, it. We had a, a um, so in our IT side of things, we were doing a, um, a GPS uh, tracking exercise with a, a, a large organization that have a very large uh, location, mm -hmm. which is uh, highly secured um, for, for uh, obvious reasons. Um, and we were doing an exercise where we were trying to um, uh, track uh, assets and, and vehicles uh, in this secured area. Mm -hmm. um, to try to, of course, uh, do some GPS fencing, make sure that things didn't go places where they're not, they're not supposed to go and, and, and did not disappear. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, the security in this location is so high that uh, there's a specialized security company handling security, and it's not the company owning the actual location or the, uh, the assets. And um, we were doing a case where we were then... Uh, 
I don't know how, how much your listeners are into to hardware or IoT, but if you want to do very frequent, we're talking seconds of, mm -hmm. of GPS location tracking, you need uh, a very strong power source uh, because it is quite power consuming. And if you don't have a continuous power source, um, you will need some quite hefty uh, batteries to run this if you don't want to run out of battery after a week. Um, so, so we had our local partner uh, that does devices create a very improvised um, uh, tracking device. It was basically a large improvised box with a lot of wires and, and large industry batteries uh, in there. And when I say industry batteries, they don't say do a cell on them. Uh, you don't. Even, it can look like anything else than a battery. <laughs> and uh, so, so we were doing a, a, a showcase for for the executive management, and and of course, you know, this whole point is about making sure things don't disappear. And all of a sudden, one of the assets disappear. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have quite tight monitoring on the devices, so we know if it's a battery, we know if it's missing connectivity, we know if it is falling off. You know things like that but it just disappeared uh and it was we, we had a quite hard time understanding what was happening so we of course alerted the people that needed to know and say no worries but we we lost uh, connection to one of your assets and um <clears throat> afterwards they of course went to to the location and 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 uh, speak to the security you know can, can we get to see this asset uh, because they weren't even allowed themselves to go there and what asset was it yeah it's this one ah okay then there was a problem. Uh, so what happened was that the security people weren't you know, briefed well enough. So when they saw this mounted, very improvised device sitting on this highly secure <laughs> asset, they had called the army uh, and the army had literally brought in the, the, um, <laughs> the bomb squad that had literally done a controlled detonation of our, of our tracking device. So, so when they came down, these these guys were were studying the fragments of our device, trying to figure out if it was a bomb, and if so, what explosive have they ever used? And then, of course, we could calm them down and say uh, something went, went terribly wrong here. It's just a tracking device. Uh, so someone got a quite big scolding in, in that uh, in that company for, for lack of communication. Oh yeah. God, <laughs> well, it, it would be so much more fun to work uh, anywhere if you could just get to blow things up or at least see them being blown up so exactly. yeah that's uh that is indeed one of one one hell of a story <laughs> <laughs> fantastic stuff but hey guys unfortunately my friends as always uh time flies when you're having fun like this uh, and it's uh, and it's uh, almost time to close another memorable episode of uh, fintech daydreaming but before we close though uh this week uh we do want to back bring our segment in the end where we uh, talk about stuff that is not directly related to the topic of the episode. And of course, since we're a bit of gadget geeks uh, here at Fintech Daydreaming, if you haven't uh, caught it up yet, uh, we of course have to talk about the new 5G iPhones uh, that were released last week. And uh, I think they actually should be shipping uh, to first customers uh, as we speak or when you listen to this podcast. So what do you guys think? Uh, is there anything in these iPhones uh, anymore? Or, or is Apple done with innovation? Or is, is it just kind of new gimmicks to sell more phones to people who are just bored in their homes uh, because they can't move anywhere because of COVID? So what do you guys think? Uh, Rasmus, perhaps first. Well, I think the whole 5G uh, you know, evolution is extremely interesting. Uh, but I think talk specifically about the iPhones. I think now a device that people are wearing all the time Due to the stability that 5G is generating, can take part in, you know, many not just financial uh, transactions, but but uh, many IoT uh, solutions in, in in general. But again, I mean, we're we're discussing it here in Floatail. I'm very interested to hear what what you guys think uh, about it. Yeah, Paul, I think we are rapidly heading towards this this permanently connected world, right? I think there's still lots to come and, and it's really interesting, I think, from, from both a society perspective, but also from a financial perspective, like, um, you know, we're focused on, on banking and finance. I think the, the capabilities and the, the use cases that could be realized with, with 5G and the ability to have, uh, you know, 5G mobile phones that you carry around with you all the time. It's it's putting the compute all the way out to the edge. I think we're going to see some fantastic things coming out of this. You add into that, you know, we always talk about blockchain, everything else. I, I think the next three years is going to see some fantastic new disruptive innovations uh, utilizing 5G, 
Uh, we've got quantum computing around the corner. Yeah. So on, on 5G, yeah. I completely agree. I think we're now <laughs> at the point in time with 5G when we're having the same questions when 3G came around. Everybody said, oh, 3G is going to change everything, but nobody had a any idea on how, what actually would that be. Well, we learned that it was actually social media, mobile social media that was really unlocked by 3G. 4G made that video uh, happen. Uh, so now we have uh, TikToks and all of these kind of mobile video platforms uh, around as a mega trend. 5G, we'll, we, will see, we will see. But there was a couple of very specific things in the, in the new iPhones that I, that I picked up uh, that could be interesting, uh, small things. But uh, for example, the LiDAR. Uh, sensor. We had a brief chat about augmented reality applications uh, in an earlier episode, uh, and uh, and I think the uh, the lidar uh, capability will make that so much more accurate that we finally could actually see some useful uh, augmented reality applications, uh, maybe even fintech-related uh, augmented reality, reality applications. And then a small detail that I'm actually not sure about. I was trying to research it, but the uh, the MagSafe. Uh, connector, uh, the magnetic thing in the back, uh, actually has an NFC reader in it. Uh, it's used for authenticating the devices that are actually connecting and basically telling the phone what is being now connected. But theoretically, if that API is open, you could do all sorts of uh, interesting uh, personalization stuff. So if you have the ability to, for example, personalize an application based on what to connect physically to the, to the device, there's certainly something there, uh, especially at the scale of iPhone. But yeah, anyway, we will see any interesting times. I'm probably going to get one anyway, so uh, I need an excuse to get it. I think that's the most important uh, thing. And then, of course, Rasmus can blow it up later. But yeah, so, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, but awesome stuff, guys. But we're really out of time now. It's uh, time has gone really fast this time. But uh, Rasmus, Paul and I would like to give you a chance to let the listeners know, uh, how can they find you? How can they get in touch with Floatail and, uh, and you later on? If they are truly tech savvy, I think they can, they can find us fairly easily without me saying too much. But of course, we have a website, floatail.ai. Uh, we are active on LinkedIn, uh, what have you, um, different media. So, so uh, as long as you can spell our name, F-L-O-W-T-A-L-E, then uh, you should be able to find us pretty much anywhere. Fantastic. And thank you again for coming on the show and sharing some great experiences uh, and insights uh, with us here today. It was my pleasure. My pleasure. But most importantly, thank you, our dear listeners, for hanging out with us uh, for another explosive episode. Uh, now, do you have a fintech <laughs> subject you would like Paul and I to cover in the future episode? Or maybe you have just a great story to share and would like to join us as a guest. Or maybe you came up with an interest uh, with a with a banking joke that you think other listeners might love or love to hate. In any case, get in touch. Uh, we are, you can find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, and Anchor.fm. And I would also like to uh, especially encourage our listeners to check out our YouTube channel. So please go there and subscribe and like. Uh, if you like the uh, if you like the episodes, uh, do like us on, on YouTube as well. Uh, it's a great way to uh, stay in touch and, and uh, also get more visibility uh, for our podcast. Now, Paul and I will be back in two weeks' time with a new guest. So uh, I will uh, we will see you again then. This has been fintech daydreaming. <laughs>